confirmatory factor analysis differs from exploratory factor analysis in that in a confirmatory factor analysis a researcher specifies the factors for the data instead of having the computer discover what are the underlying factors. So confirmatory factor analysis requires that you specify the expected result and then computer will tell you if that result fits your data and will estimate the factor loadings for you. This is a more flexible approach to factor analysis than an exploratory analysis. In this video I will demonstrate you uh, on a conceptual level what confirmatory factor analysis does and how it can be applied to more or different kinds of scenarios. Our data has uh, three, uh, six indicators. We have indicators A1 through A3 that are supposed to measure construct A. So we can see that there is variation in these indicators uh, due to construct A. And there is also some random noise, uh, the E here, though that's unreliability of these indicators. And then we have some variance components that is reliable. So for example, if we measure A3 multiple times, there is a specific uh, part of the uh, A3 that is reliable, but it is specific to A3. So for example, if we ask whether a company is innovative or not, that uh, measures innovativeness, it can also measure something else. So the only uh, unreliability is not the only source of measurement error, but there is also some item uniqueness. And um, the idea of a confirmatory factor analysis is that we uh, specify a factor model for this data ourselves. So for example, we would say that uh, because these are uh, three indicators A1 through A3 are supposed to measure construct A, we are uh, assign them to factor A and then we assign these to factor B and then each, fa each indicator also uh, gets an error term. Then the factor analysis takes the variance of those indicators apart into variance that can be attributed to the factors and variance that can be attributed to the error terms like so. So now we have a factor solution here. We have all variation that is due to the uh, concept A goes to factor A, all variation that is due to concept B goes to factor B, and all these uh, item uniqueness and unreliability goes to the error terms that are assumed to be uncorrelated. So these are uncorrelated distinct sources of variation for each indicator, and then we have the two common factors. So that's the idea of case. Sometimes uh, your data are not as, as great as you would like and uh, confrontative factor analysis allows you to model also problems in your measurement. So for example if we have uh, this kind of scenario there is a uh, variation again due to construct A, variation due to construct B and then we have uh, unreliability the black circles here and we have unique aspects of each indicator but there is also some variation in A3 and, and B1 that correlates so the variance component R here. These, these letters are no particular meaning, by the way. They're just letters to distinguish these uh, different circles. So um, A3 and B1 correlate for some other reason than, than measuring A and measuring B that could possibly be correlated. If we fit a confrontative factor analysis model, then uh, this variation uh, that is shared by A1, A3 and B1 actually goes to the factors. The reason why it goes to the factors is that these error terms are, are constrained to be uncorrelated. And uh, what happens now is that our factors, which are supposed to present construct A and construct B, are contaminated by this uh, secondary source of variation R that was present in A3 and B1. And as a consequence, the correlation between factors A and B will be overestimated and the results will be biased. And this is also the case in exploratory factor analysis. So uh, if you have uh, two factors that influence, or if we have this kind of like minor factor that influences A3 and B1, and we only get two factors, then the factor correlation be between those two factors will be inflated. If we were to run an exploratory analysis, then the exploratory analysis could identify that there is a third factor that loads on uh, A3 and B1, but because it's just two indicators, it's also possible that the exploratory analysis wouldn't identify the, that factor for us. So what can we do with this kind of situation? Uh, confrontary analysis allows us to also model correlated errors. So instead of uh, specifying that these are uh, 
error terms of A3 and B1 are uncorrelated. We can say that it's possible that A3 and B1 correlate for some other reason. So we relax the constraint. We specify that these two can be correlated and then uh, the, the variation in A3 and B1 that is shared between these indicators but not with others, so it's not part of the factors, then uh, gets to escape the, these error terms. And then we also again get clean estimate of the factor correlation A and B. But this is, uh, this is something that many people do. So uh, your statistical software will tell you that the model doesn't fit the data perfectly. And it'll also tell you that you could freeze some correlations to make the model fit better. And, but that's uh, a bit dangerous unless you know what you're doing. You should only add this kind of uh, correlated errors if you have a good theoretical reason to do so. So the fact that your statistical software tells you to do is that you could do something to increase the uh, model fit is not a reason to do something. It's, it's an indication that you could do something and you should consider something. It's not a, a definite guideline that you should actually do that. So uh, under which scenario then uh, are you, uh, is it a good idea to allow the error terms of two indicators to correlate? For example, if our indicators uh, would look like that. So we would have indicators about innovativeness. So A here, A factor here is innovativeness and B factor is productivity. So we would have questions about innovativeness and questions about productivity. Then uh, we realized that, okay, so uh, A3 is uh, our personal is innovative and B1 is our personal is productive. So both of these actually are have this, this personnel dimension as well. So they all don't measure only innovative and productivity. They also measure uh, how high quality the personnel in the company are. So uh, then we realized that okay, so there is a secondary dimension that these two indicators measure and then we can add the error correlation here. But it also you have to justify it. So it's not enough that you say that our statistical software tells us that the model fits better if we do something. You have to justify it also in non-statistical terms. This is the same thing like with the outliers. You don't delete an observation because it is different. You have to explain why it's different in non-statistical terms. The same thing when you uh, eliminate indicators from a scale. So your statistical software will tell you that sometimes eliminating an item from a scale will make Cronbach's alpha to go up, but that's not a reason to eliminate an item. You should also look at non-statistical criteria. So what does the item look like? Is there a good reason why we think it's less reliable? Because uh, these kind of uh, suggestions by your software, they could also be just uh, a random correlation between two random uh, elements. So random correlation between this E's and then you would be misspecifying the model. Another way, uh, perhaps a bit better way to accomplish the same is to specify this uh, secondary factor. So we could instead saying that these two error terms are, are, are correlated, we could say that this is, these indicators A3 and B1 actually are also measure something else. So we, we add this secondary factor here. And uh, this is a, a bit more appealing approach because then it makes you, uh, you have to explicitly then interpret what this factor means. And uh, it's a lot easier to free correlations without explaining what they are actually, what's the interpretation of these two, two uh, of the correlation between these error terms. It's a lot easier to do that without an explanation than adding a factor. So if you had to add a factor, then your readers will ask you to explain it. And you always should. So it's a good idea to have the factor instead of having the correlation. Mathematically, both of these accomplish the exact same thing. They allow the uh, unique aspect of A3 and B1 that is correlated to escape from the error terms. This example of adding uh, the uh, minor factor can be extended to also another scenario. So that's uh, just the, uh, the same indicators again. We can uh, have this kind of scenario. So uh, what's the scenario here? We have uh, indicators A1 through A3 measure A indicators B1 to B3 measure B. 
there, there's unreliability, there is, and then there is some variation that is shared by all the indicators. Uh, that variation could be, for example, variation due to the measurement method. So this is a, a scenario where you would have common method variance. So the R would be here, the, co the variation due to the method or the common method variance. And then we, if we estimate a factor model with A1, A2 and A3 loading on A, and these B indicators loading on B, then all variation due to the method escapes to this B factor and A factor, and the factor correlation will be overestimated greatly. So uh, in this kind of scenario, it is possible to also specify a secondary factor. So we can specify uh, this uh, method factor here. And uh, the idea is that all the indicators load on the, the factors that they're supposed to measure, the factors representing the constructs and a factor representing the measurement process. So uh, looks really good and looks good, too good to be true. But this is not the panacea for method variance problems. There are, this kind of model is problematic to estimate. The reason for that is that a high correlation between A and B is nearly indistinguishable from a A1, A2, A3, B1, B2, B3 just being caused by one factor. So they are empirically are nearly impossible to distinguish. So this kind of model is very unstable to estimate. In practice, uh, these models uh, have been shown to be problematic even in simula with simulated data sets. But there's one way that this kind of model can work and it's if you uh, add these marker indicators. So sometimes you see in published papers that they use marker indicators. The idea of marker indicators is that you uh, have indicators that are unrelated with the factors that you're, you're modeling. So A1 and B1. B are unrelated to this M1 and M2. For example, if you use uh, innovativeness and productivity and then you have uh, questions on one to seven scale, you could have uh, a marker indicator of whether the person likes jazz music or not. I've actually seen that being used. The idea is that how much you like jazz music uh, is completely unrelated uh, with the innovativeness and productivity of your company. But if the jazz music indicator correlates with these uh, indicators, then we can assume that that correlation is purely due to the measurement method because uh, jazz music liking and innovation really are two uh, completely different things.